Hey everyone, that was Fragile Fantasy from the Genshin Impact soundtrack. Now, I want to focus on the Genshin Impact soundtrack for today because of the way it captures this very nostalgic quality that I think is present across a lot of music that's very, very popular. Um, that's music such as that from the Zelda series, music by Joe Hisashi is another great example. Um, it's all music that evokes this very childlike sense of wonder. One of the reasons this nostalgic quality works so well in Genshin Impact is because all of the designs are so whimsical, and I mean this in a good way, very childlike. You know, even the enemies themselves are friend-shaped, and there's never really any scary moments, there's never any real danger. So how does it do this? Well, there's a couple ways. Um, I think the most obvious and simplest way is through the instrumentation. Strings tend to take a back role in the soundtrack, serving more as a harmonic or a rhythmic function, rather than a melodic one that you're supposed to focus on with your ear. The melody is instead given to especially reed instruments that we don't hear as often, um, like bassoon, clarinet, and English horn. These soundtracks also feature a lot of pizzicato, or plucking, in the string section as well, which is another way that the strings fade to the background to give other instruments that we don't hear as often room to shine. More unique to Genshin Impact is the way that we have these short, uh, I'm going to call them vignettes, these like little one-minute repeating tracks that play throughout the world. The music will fade out, you'll explore, and then all of a sudden you'll hear this tune that'll repeat two, three times for a couple minutes, and it's gone again. Um, a lot of these vignettes share a similar melody, they share a similar what we call harmonic progression, the same chords, and this, again, feeds that layer of nostalgia, where you're thinking, oh, I just heard this, but last time it was sad and now it's happy, or something like that. For instance, Fragile Fantasy, Once Colored Memories, and Serene and Sweet Adieu are all more or less the same melody, but it's approached in a very different way with different instrumentations and a different vibe. Revisiting these sounds with a new perspective is what gives us this feeling of nostalgia. This is a good segue to another concept in music, but also art in a more general sense, that every emotion needs to be balanced out by its counterpart. For instance, loss is so much more profound when we hear the happiness that came before. Similarly, happiness feels stronger when we hear the sadness that is changing. There's a really good example of this in Fragile Fantasy where it teases a shift to a minor key but then never really arrives. I'm going to give you an example of this now. You hear how it sounds like something bad is about to happen and then it doesn't and we get this sense of relief? There's a lot of music theory involved in why this happens, so I'm going to try to break it down for you step by step. When we talk about the key that a piece of music is in, we're talking primarily about the scale that the music is based on. For instance, this piece is in B flat major, so it's based on the B flat major scale. Now what does major mean? Well, again, these are very complex questions, but in a very general sense, in our scale we have the third and fourth notes of the scale are close together. In the case of B flat, that's D and E flat. And the seventh and eighth note of the scale, that's going to be A and B flat, are close together. We call this a half step. And if you know a piano keyboard layout, these are going to be two notes, two keys, that are right next to each other. Generally, we think of major as having a very happy sound, or a triumphant sound. I'm going to play a B flat major scale for you now with a visualization of the keyboard, so you can see the half steps. On the other hand, if we take the same notes of the B-flat major scale, but start counting from a different note, in this case G, we're going to get the following intervals. Everything will be a whole step except for two places, between the second and third notes, which will be a half step, or close together, and between the fifth and sixth notes, which will also be close together. We call this pattern minor. Compared to major, we think about minor as much more sad or anxious. Um, so I'm going to play these notes for you. You see how it's the same notes as the B-flat scale? But we just start on a different note. In a variation of minor that we sometimes call melodic minor, we're sort of combining these two scales, the major and the minor. So now we have half steps between the second and third notes, and we have half steps between the seventh and eighth note. So the only difference from a major scale, at least on the way up, is that your third note is going to be lower, where the half step is between the second and third note instead of the third and fourth note. 
The reason we use melodic minor, quite frankly, more often than we use regular minor, is because it gives more what we call motion to the music. I'm going to play the same example again, but this time I've reduced each measure to a chord. What I mean by reducing it is that we're taking all of the important notes and then smooshing them down and playing them all at the same exact time. Here's the example. You see the F sharp? This is our hint that we're moving to minor, and particularly G minor. There's no F sharp in B flat major, but there is one in G minor, and this would be a very natural way to change to minor. So let's hear it if we actually go to minor instead of staying in major. On the other hand, if we take away the F sharp, it sounds like this. Now we're staying in major the whole time, and without that element of danger, the whimsical nature of the rest of the piece isn't as strong, because we don't have this negative aspect to compare it to. Now I've been focusing my technical tips for the last couple videos on the right hand, or the bow hand, so I want to talk about the left hand this time. I think one of the hardest things about playing violin is synchronizing our right hand with our left hand. It's about changing the bow at the same time you put a new finger down, so it sounds like one note instead of this garbled mess. Since this is so difficult, why do it if we don't have to? Anytime you change strings, you can actually put your finger down in advance of the bow change, because that way you're ready to play it as soon as you change your bow. And it's not like you need your finger on the other string. You can think about it like you're going to play a chord or multiple notes at once, but instead of playing them all at once, you just play them one, two, three, or one, two, however many notes there are. We can do other things by keeping our fingers down as well though. For instance, in this sequence of notes, I keep my first finger, or my index finger, down almost the entire time. Now the reason for that is because it gives me a really good reference point to play my other notes in tune. Otherwise, I'd have to pick up my finger, move it to another string, and things could get off. If you're already playing in tune, why risk changing? One of the hardest notes to play in this example is the E flat to the A. We call this a diminished fifth. The reason for this is that the fingers need to be so close together, it's actually very difficult to do if you're putting both your fingers on the same string. So that's a bit of a tangent, but there's all kinds of cases where looking in advance of what you're going to be doing and putting your fingers down in preparation makes a huge difference. In slower passages, this is great because you can usually have much smoother bow changes. You're not worrying about changing your left hand and your right hand at the same time, but it's also super helpful in fast passages. If your fingers know where to go in advance of the note, they're already moving into place before you're ready to change your bow, you're gonna be much more accurate and much faster. So thanks for watching. Um, in terms of what I'm practicing this week, I'm gonna be working on my bow changes because right now I'm exaggerating them a little bit too much. It's giving a bit of an accent where I don't want it. Um, so I'm just gonna be doing some nice long bows, really working on this right hand flexibility that I talked about in a previous video so that I don't ever have an accent when I don't want one because that's no good. So let me know what you're working on, what you're practicing, what you're listening to, what you're playing. And I look forward to seeing you next time.